This is a distributed database that uses the PostgreSQL extension APIs. Citus horizontally scales PostgreSQL across multiple machines using sharding and replication behind the covers. Citus's query engine parallelizes SQL queries across the machines in the cluster. Most importantly, Citus 6.1 is open source. If you'd like to try it out or if you have any feedback for us, please hit us up over GitHub, Slack or Google forums. What are some good use cases for Citus? Citus serves many use cases and three common ones include the following. First, if you have a multi-tenant database that needs to linearly scale, Citus enables that with minimal changes to your application. Second, when you have a large data set and where you want to get answers from that data in human real time, typically in less than a second, you want to use Citus. Third, if you need to write large volumes of data into your database, and if you'd like to combine the power of structured and semi-structured data, Citus is a good fit. With that, let's dive right into our talk. Here is a quick talk outline. We're going to start this talk by first defining what it means to scale. We're also going to talk about different ways to scale and when you need to scale. Then we're going to define what a multi-tenant database is. After talking about scale and multi-tenancy, we'll talk about data modeling for uh, multi-tenant databases. We're also going to provide an example database schema here. Next, I'll talk about three different approaches to scaling a multi-tenant database. Lucas will then take over the slides and talk about integrating your multi-tenant database to your application. He'll then do a short demo. And finally, we'll conclude with a Q&A. With that, let's first get started by defining what it means to scale. At a high level, scaling is the process of providing more resources to your application or your database with the intent to improve its performance. Also, as a general rule of thumb, scaling computation is always easier than scaling data. For example, let's say that you have a website that serves customer traffic, Amazon.com. If you needed to scale your front end, you can just provision hundreds of servers on the fly, put them behind a load balancer, and scale your website. Doing the same for your database, however, tends to be much harder. And in this tutorial, we're going to focus on the database scaling aspect. When you're scaling your database, you need to think about both hardware and software resources. Usually, though, if you can linearly scale your hardware, you're in a good place to scale your database. We're therefore going to focus on the hardware scaling dimension in this talk. So scaling databases and then hardware scaling databases. Okay, what are the ways to scale your hardware? Uh, the first way is known as vertical scaling. In this approach, you simply go and buy a bigger machine. In this example, we have a PostgreSQL machine that has four CPUs, 30 gigs of RAM, 80 gigs of local storage. We went and bought a machine that had four times the resources or provisioned one on AWS. And then we simply migrated our PostgreSQL database to that bigger machine. This approach is the simplest form of scaling your hardware resources, and we recommend that you leverage it. That said, what is a possible drawback associated with this approach? Cost. Anything. Cost could be one. So yes. Uh, eventually, if your application keeps growing, you may hit a wall. And in that case, you will need to scale out your database into many different machines. When you follow this approach, you can continue to scale your CPU, memory, and storage resources by adding new machines into your cluster. This approach is also known as horizontal scaling, and now we're going to focus on this type of scaling in our talk. Now, an important, a very important question to answer is, when is the right time to think about horizontal scaling? The answer to that question primarily depends on where in your application and database's life cycle you are. If you're at a stage where you can throw more hardware at the problem, we recommend that you always do that first, because that's easy. We also recommend spending time in tuning your database's config settings and optimizing your queries. In other words, if you don't need to scale out, don't scale out. With that said, if your SaaS application is growing, there will be a point where you're going to start running into performance issues. So when is the right time? When is that time to start thinking about scaling out? We've seen hundreds of users and customers who look to scale out their Postgres databases at Citus. In terms of when to scale, I compiled three heuristics that I wanted to share. 
these aren't hard-written rules. It's best to think of them as general guidelines. The first one is if your business is growing and you're on the second largest instance type available on your cloud provider, you probably want to start thinking about scaling out. Why the second largest instance type and not the largest one? Because your business will continue to grow on and being on the second largest instance type will give you breathing room while you start thinking about scaling and sharding. A second heuristic that usually applies for OLTP type workloads is auto vacuum. PostgreSQL uses auto vacuum daemons to clean up load caused by MVCC. The default vacuum settings are too conservative. These are in this column. And if you haven't tuned them, we recommend that you should uh, you look into tuning them. We have certain suggestions in here on the right hand side. If you tune them for your workload and you're still experiencing performance issues related to vacuum, then it may be a good time to start thinking about scaling out. A third heuristic relates to how much of your working set your database can serve from memory. Most databases will track how often you hit the cache and when you need to issue disk I/O. For LTP applications, most of your working set should be served from the cache. Ideally, you'd want to serve 95 to 99 percent of your lookup queries from the cache itself. In PostgreSQL, a good way to calculate your cache hit ratios is by running these queries. The query at the top measures the cache hit ratio for your tables, and the query below measures it for indexes. And if your cache hit ratio for your database starts dropping below 95-99%, then it may be a good time to start thinking about horizontal scaling. To recap, you have several heuristics that you can keep an eye out for. And by using these heuristics, you can have a sense of the right time to scale. Then when that com uh, time comes, what do you do? What are different approaches that enable you to scale out? We find that the answer to that question depends a lot on your requirements, and the following two questions on the slides help better identify those requirements. First, are you looking to scale out a database that serves a B2B, B2B2C, or a B2C type workload? This has notable impact on your data model. Second, do you have a transactional or an analytical workload? This question is orthogonal to the first one. You can have a B2C application that can be a transactional or a, an analytical workload that serves one. And in the talk, we're focusing on the first dimension, the B2B type workloads, in the rest of this talk. So, I just, when you say multi tenant, does that mean that you keep all of your clients' data in a single database, or does that mean that you have multiple databases? One of it doesn't necessarily mean that you can actually have multiple, like one client in a separate database. And I'll talk about the different approaches that you can take in maybe five, ten slides. Okay. Yeah. On the B2B side, and I'm primarily thinking of it as B2B workloads, they lend themselves uh, to what's known as a multi-tenant database. That's the primary relation. And if you're building a B2B application, most information relates to your tenants or your customers or your accounts, and your database tables capture this natural relationship. As an example, you could be building a marketing automation tool for other businesses. In this case, each business that you serve, along with their data, becomes a tenant in your database. And the notion of a multi-tenant database isn't new. It's been around for at least two decades. What's new, and primarily in the context of scaling multi-tenant databases, is the web and the cloud. We now have cost-effective SaaS applications. These applications no longer only serve Fortune 1000 companies, but they also empower thousands of other businesses. And these SaaS applications more and more rely on open source, and they need ways to scale to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of tenants. Further, SaaS applications can store even more information to help their customers, thanks to sharp drops in hardware prices. These reasons combined create a distinct motivation to scale multi-tenant databases. Google's F1 paper is a good example that demonstrates a multi-tenant database that scales this way. The paper talks about technical challenges associated with scaling out the Google AdWords platform to over a million tenants. The paper also describes common relational database properties F1 leverages for powering the underlying AdWords platform. Those features are transactions, joins across tables to avoid data duplication, and database constraints to make sure that each tenant's data remains consistent. Okay, this is, can everyone see this slide? 
So this is a slide from the F1 paper. The paper highlights the best way, like the best way to model your data to support many tenants customers in a distributed database. <coughs> Uh, the database on the left hand side is the relational data model. Can everyone see the slides more or less? And it is an example. At the top is that there is a customer, say Citus Data uses Google AdWords, so Citus Data is a Google AdWords customer. That data in the relational model is, has a primary key on the customer ID dimension. We run campaigns, so each campaign goes into a table, it has a campaign ID, and then each campaign has ad groups within it. So there is that, uh, there are those three tables. If you model this data based on the relational model, the customer table has the customer ID as the primary key, the campaign, campaign ID, and ad group has the ad group ID. And when you overlay that into a distributed cluster, so the customer data lives in some place, the campaigns live on like some other machines, and the ad groups live on a third different machine or like multiple different machines. The thing is, most operations that you perform on this model are on a per customer basis. So, Side to state around campaigns and ad groups, so all of those operations actually are related to a particular customer. So when you start a transaction in a distributed cluster, you're actually performing a lot of operations to make sure that that transaction executes over the network. On the right hand side, there is an alternate data model, in fact, the predominant data model prior to the relational data model, which is the hierarchical data model. And in that model, you still have those three tables, but each table has the customer ID. As, as part of its primary key at the very beginning. What that enables you to do is the data that relates to a particular customer, say Citus data, and the campaigns and the ad groups are co-located together. That way when you run a transaction that relates to Citus data, it goes to the same machine. When you have joins, all of, most of the joins are executed locally. And when you have foreign key constraints, you can actually enforce those foreign key constraints without uh, paying the penalty of the network. Does this make sense? The two models? Yes, no, questions? And going into the key benefit to the hierarchical database model is that it enforces data collocation. In its simplest form, you add a customer ID, tenant ID column to your tables, and then shard those tables on customer ID. This ensures that data from the same customer gets collocated together, and collocation dramatically reduces the costs associated with distributed transactions, joins, and constraints. Collocation also simplifies the cost associated with handling network and machine failures. In summary, the hierarchical database model brings performance as a key benefit. And I'll look at the concept a bit deeper because the rest of the talk actually depends on this concept. In the diagram, we have three tables, stores, products, and purchases. Think of a storefront say AWS, uh, Amazon storefronts or Shopify. And then all three tables in this model are actually distributed on the store ID. So you'll see that the store ID one has the products in here and has the purchases with the store ID one in here. So all of the data that belongs to a particular store is collocated together. And then this way when you're doing these transactions or joins, you can always push them down to the machine and not pay the penalty of the network. Now, this concept of collocation or collocating tables to the same machine sounds great, but what happens if you have a table that doesn't fit into this model? For example, this could happen if you have a web application that serves different organizations. Each organization normally has its own users. However, you may want to simplify the login process for users who log into multiple accounts. So you could handle this user's login table in one of two ways. You could either keep it as a regular PostgreSQL table, or you could shard your user's login table on the user ID column and make sure that you don't join it with the other tables. A second common table type is small tables that touch across all tenant related tables. For these tables, one option is to denormalize them into larger tables. Another option <coughs> is to create reference tables that are replicated across two machines. So these tables could be, for example, your nations table, your time zone table, your regions table. All good. Now that we talked about scaling multi-tenant databases, let's look at different ways to implement this approach. This goes into the earlier question. If you'd like to scale your multi-tenant database, how do you go about it? At a higher level, you have three options. You can create a separate database for each tenant customer. You can create a separate schema for each tenant customer. 
or you can have all tenants share the same tables within a database. Each one of these design options come with different benefits, and I'll look to describe them in the next few slides. In the first approach, you create a separate database for each tenant. From a hardware standpoint, these databases could all be living on the same machine, or they could be living on separate physical machines. And in each case, you allocate its own fair share of resources to each database. For example, in this diagram, we have three databases for three tenants. And usually these databases share the same table schemas, indexes, PLPG SQL functions. On the left hand side we have a tenant 5. And then this database serves tenant 5's data. So when you have a query that comes for tenant 5, you direct it to this particular database. And then this approach, creating a separate database for each tenant, optimizes for isolation of tenants. You may need to use this model in industries such as healthcare or finance where you have regulatory requirements. This also model also has the benefit that you could give each tenant freeform SQL access to the underlying database and have them run their own queries. The trade-off is DBAs now need to manage different databases and make sure that each database gets allocated its fair share of hardware resources. In practice, customers who have isolation of tenants as their primary decision criteria usually lean towards this approach. In the second design pattern, you create a separate namespace slash schema for each tenant within the same database. From a hardware standpoint, these schemas could again all live on the same machine, or you could add logic to place them on different machines. In this diagram, for example, tenant 5 lives in a particular namespace within the database. And when you send a query to your database, you first say search path, like set that search path to 5, and then you route all queries to that particular uh, schema namespace. When you think of isolation and uh, resource sharing as the trade-offs, this second design pattern sits between options 1 and 3. In this model, you can continue to isolate a tenant's data and queries into a particular database schema. Still, the model may or may not address the regulatory requirements depending on your industry. Similarly, compared to the one database per tenant model, this approach does a more efficient job at sharing resources. You now have one database that manages all resources allocated to it. At the same time, you may start observing other resource challenges. For example, each, if each one of your tenants has 100 tables and you have 1,000 tenants, in total your database uh, needs to manage 100,000 tables and associated indexes. ORM tools cache metadata related to all tables in the database when they start up, so each ORM process then caches data related to 100,000 tenants, tables. The third design pattern is the one where all tenants share the same tables in a particular database. In this approach, you simply add a tenant ID column to all your tables and then shard them across your cluster. In this diagram, for example, you have three tables, accounts, tenants, campaigns, leads, and in this approach you added a tenant ID column to your leads table, and then you added tenant ID 5 for the leads that belong to tenant ID 5, and another tenant ID for a different lead. So each tenant and each tenant's data becomes rows in your database, within the same database table. And then you ensure that these tables are consistent through database constraints. Any questions up to this point? And in the third approach, you don't have the strict isolation guarantees as the one database per tenant approach. For example, your application needs to add a tenant ID filter to queries going to the database. On the scaling side, this design pattern easily scales to tens of thousands of tenants, since all tenant data lives as rows in regular database tables. This approach also simplifies the operational burden. For example, you can add columns to your table schema and the database takes care of all the work for across all of your tenants. So the question is, how do you pick between these three design patterns? The truth is, each one of the three design options, with enough effort, can address questions around scale, data that varies across tenants, and isolation. The decision depends on the primary dimension you're building optimizing for. A simple rule of thumb is, if you're building for scale, have all tenants share the same tables. If you're building for isolation, Creating a, create a separate database for each tenant. Now, 
I'm not sure if our question is why having all tenants share the same tables provides better scaling characteristics. The answer to that question comes from our definition of scaling. Scaling is allocating more hardware and software resources to your database. The more efficiently those resources are shared, the better your scaling characteristics get. As an example, if you create a separate database for each tenant, then you need to separately allocate disk, memory, and CPU to each database. Further, databases usually make assumptions about resources available to them. For example, PostgreSQL has shared buffers, makes good use of the operating system cache, and comes with connection count settings. If you're running 50 of these databases as separate databases, then you may be okay. If you're running 100 or 200 on a few physical machines, then resource pooling becomes tricky even with today's virtualization tech. And if you have a distribute, yep. Sorry, I just want to say that I think there's something in between those two that I think you're going to suggest the other way is the tenant ID column. And the other things are schemas with search paths, and then, you know, some people, they create a database, mm -hmm. right? named after each customer, not a separate cluster, because you're talking about a separate cluster here. In this slide I am, and I think what you're proposing is the one that's in between, which is this approach, uh, where you okay. basically are setting the search path and then sending the query to here. From a resource sharing and pulling standpoint, I think it sits between option one and three. Like that's, I think, more or less the... And um, yes, I'm basically comparing right now the one and three approaches, taking the isolation and like scaling uh, them together. In the schema model, I think you don't now need to manage the hardware because your database manages the hardware for you. Uh, the flip side is now you're putting, say again, if you have a thousand schemas with each a thousand tables, now your database manages way more tables and indexes than it typically would. Yep. I'm going back into this. Uh, looking at the other one where you're sharing the entire table schema, if you have a distributed database that manages all of the tenants, then you're basically uh, delegating that you're using your database for what it's designed to do. Uh, you could shard on tenant ID and easily support hundreds of thousands of tenants. When all tenants share the same tables, a second related benefit involves operational simplicity. As your application grows, you will iterate on your database model and make improvements. For example, you may need to change the schema for one of your tables or add an index to improve query performance. If you're following an architecture where each tenant is in a separate database, then you need to implement an infrastructure that ensures that each schema change either succeeds across all tenants or it eventually gets rolled back. So the responsibility is on your side. For example, what happens when you change the schema for 5,000 of your 10,000 tenants and one of the machines in your cluster fails? How do you handle that? When you shard your tables for multi-tenancy, then you're having your database do the work for you. The database will either ensure that an alter table goes through across all the shards, or it will roll it back. So I'm about to wrap up, and before I wrap up, I also wanted to touch upon a question that we hear very frequently uh, across all three design patterns. That question is, how does my largest tenant affect my scaling properties? We find that the tenant data in multi-tenant databases usually follows a ZIF distribution. That is, you have a few popular tenants and then a long tail. You might have also heard of this distribution as the power law, the Pareto law, or the 80-20 rule. How many of you have heard any one of those names, ZIF distribution, power laws, 80-20 rules? Okay, about like uh, more than uh, half. Uh, and they actually refer, all refer to the same concept, but then they use different ways to express that concept, visualize this concept. In this graph, I'm using the ZIF representation. Uh, what this basically is, to construct this graph, let's say you start with your, a representative sample of your database. Let's say you take 0.1% of your data, you take a dump, you then take all tenants in that sample and count the number of rows where they occurred. You then sort those tenants by their number of rows and plot that ranking on an x-axis. So this is the x-axis. In this sample, the most popular tenant had 100,000 rows. The second most popular one had like 70, 80,000 rows. And this is the least popular tenant that appeared in the sample, like which is at like the 150,000 tenant, which appeared only once. And one thing to keep in mind is this is a log log axis. So if your sample was bigger, or if your, if your data was bigger, the curve would move, move, would move up, but the slope would remain uh, the same. So it's the same behavior. Your uh, behavior would uh, be the same. Now, 
How does the theory between behind Zippo power law distributions help us? It helps us in the following way. When you're looking to migrate your single machine database, your own PostgreSQL, an important question to answer is, what percentage of the total data size does the largest tenant hold? That is, if your existing database serves 100 tenants, and the largest tenant holds only 10% of the data, then this approach will help you scale by 10x. If you assume a standard ZIF distribution and more or less these databases fit into that distribution, uh, then we can come up with the following heuristics. Where you have 10 tenants, your largest tenant roughly holds about 60% of the data. Where you have 10,000 tenants, this means that your most popular tenant will hold about 2 to 3% of the data and you'll be able to scale to 50x of where you are today. Of course, these are general guidelines and the best way to tell is by looking at your own data. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lucas to talk about the application side of things and do a quick demo. And I'll probably take a few minutes because I need to connect to like three different things. Cool. Uh, so if there's any questions for us, Ben. So have you, have you addressed the, uh, the problem where you have a single tenant that overgrows your biggest machine that, that you have? Not the biggest machine. Typically, uh, people who use Citus or people that we talk to have 10,000, 100,000 tenants, like lots of tenants. And in that case, and if they own PostgreSQL, the largest tenant is about like 1% of the data, so they have room to grow. Uh, they still ask about, hey, for my largest tenant, how can I isolate it? So in Citus, there is a function that isolates the largest tenant to a particular hardware or the largest tenants. Uh, so far, for like large number of tenant counts, we haven't had customers who overgrew the, whose like largest tenant overgrew a single machine. Right. We have work in that area. We can chat after the talk. Also need oh yeah. <laughs>